we're going to go ahead and um, get started here. So I'm going to turn this over to Deborah Lewis. She is with the California State Library, and we are so pleased that she's able to give this presentation for us. She's with the Geological and Local History um, area of the Sutro Library. She's earned her master's degree in library and information science at UCLA. She has a passion for archives and genealogy, um, and she began her research with an interview with her great aunt Essie, which I love. So we are so excited to welcome Deborah to our virtual space, and we will go ahead and get started if you'd like to share screen, and thank you all again. All right, hi everyone. My name is Deborah Lewis, and I'm the genealogy and local history librarian at Sutra Library. I first wanna say just how amazing it is to see there are people from all over the country here today. And uh, thank you for taking the time to be at this talk. I gotta say that is like the most wide coverage I think I've ever presented to anybody. <laughs> so thank you for being here. Um, for those who don't know, Sutro Library is a branch of the California State Library, which is located in San Francisco on the San Francisco State University campus. And the other California State Library sections are located in Sacramento. And I will say that I am the genealogy librarian until the end of the month, until June 24th, actually. And after that, I will be transferring to the California History section, which is our sister branch in Sacramento. However, this presentation will cover what I've learned thus far at Sutra Library in the five years that I've been here. And uh, let me know in the chat if you've ever been to our library before, and we'll get started. Today, uh, my, my hope is that this, will, this presentation will bring you to the Sutra Library, either physically or virtually, and I'll cover a general overview of resources at our library. I'll talk about who was Adolf Sutro, why you should come to the Sutra Library, um, again, either physically or virtually, and what to expect before you visit, and what treasures await you, and how to access some of these resources remotely. But before I continue, I am just want you to know that I am getting over an illness, so I apologize if I cough and I'm unable to mute myself in time. Um, but there's that, and I I do um, let the moderators know if I'm talking a little too fast and if and tell them if that you need me to slow down. But uh, I tend to get a little excited when I talk about the Sutro Library and genealogy, and so my voice will often reflect that. But I will occasionally take a breath here and there to slow myself down. All right, let's get started. Adolf Sutro, uh, we can't talk about the library without talking about Adolf Sutro. And he is the reason, of course, why our library exists. He was born in Germany, uh, Aachen, Prussia, to be exact, in 1830. And 20 years later, he immigrated with his mother and his siblings to San Francisco. He started off as an entrepreneur, opening several grocery and tobacco stores. Having studied engineering in Germany, he then found a way to use these skills in the mining industry of Nevada, specifically by building a tunnel to connect to the Comstock load. And after Sutro Tunnel was completed, he then sold it and used his wealth to purchase land in San Francisco. And it was said that he owned at least one twelfth of the city at one point. And while he's doing all of this, he is collecting, he and his agents are collecting books from all over the world. And sometimes he would buy entire bookstores sight unseen. Um, part of our collection does include the first academic library in the Americas. And the collection spans nine centuries, beginning as early as the 13th century, though we do have some materials from much earlier, such as the Cunea form tablet, which is a couple thousands years old. And it's about like two inches by one inch. It's very tiny. And that's really cool to look at if you ever get a chance. Sutro's goal was to create a research library to enhance the cultural good of San Francisco. But unfortunately, the library was put on hold when he was elected mayor in 1895 to 1897. And then double, unfortunately, he died a year later in 1898 before his dreams for his library could come to fruition. I wanted to give a brief history of the library itself. The heirs did fulfill their father's wish by gifting the library to the state of California. That is the people of California. Unfortunately, while they were making this decision, the 1906 earthquake and fire happens and we lose 60% of our collection. We officially open our doors in 1917 as a state library 
And that's when our genealogy collection officially begins with donations and loans from the genealogical community. And that isn't to say that Adolf's uh, original collection does not have materials that you can use for genealogical research. It does, and I will show you examples of that later on in the presentation. And then for a number of decades, we hopped around from one temporary location to the next until we made it to our permanent home in the J. Paul Leonard Sutra Library on the SF State campus. Now let's cover what you'll expect, uh, what to expect before you visit. And we are now open to walk-ins, which means you don't need to make an appointment to visit our reading room. However, if you are looking at materials that say they are located in the vault, so in the catalog, it'll say the location is vault, then that is our closed stacks. And you will need to schedule an appointment at least 72 hours in advance. And you can do that through the link on the screen. It's also in your handout, libca.libcal.com. And you don't need a library card to access our reading room or our materials or even to make an appointment. But if you're a state employee, a California state uh, employee, you are able to get a library card and this affords you um, certain privileges like requesting materials directly from the state library, as well as using some of the databases remotely. On site at our library, we have lockers for you to put any belongings that we don't allow in there. So like food, drinks, bags. We have scanners, or we have these um, computers, I'm getting ahead of myself. We have computers that you can access our databases from. Uh, so you don't need to bring a laptop if you don't want to. And we have scanners instead of photocopiers. So we encourage you to bring a flash drive. We don't have ways for you to make um, hard copies. Uh, so because we are a green library. So definitely bring a flash drive a USB drive um, to save your scans to it. And we of course have microfilm readers located near our microfilm collection. And lastly, we have a great view, which I feel a photo does not do it justice. So you will have to come see it for yourself. And while we are a public library, we do consider ourselves a special collection. And similar to most special collections and archives, we only allow loose paper. So no notebooks or binders or folders and we allow pencils and we allow mobile devices. We have paper, we have plenty of pencils, and we have Wi-Fi access for your laptops and your phones. And keep in mind, any bags that the laptops come in will need to be locked away in the locker. And I understand that as a genealogist, we often store our research in binders and notebooks. Um, so it's you know, sometimes impossible to conduct research without it. So a way to accommodate this is if you if you must bring it in, you are able to leave it at a table near the reference desk so that you can refer to it as needed. The services that we perform at Sutro Library are also performed by the other California State Library sections um, located in Sacramento. What we'll do is we perform lookups and search publications, We'll do reasonable amounts of scanning. We, of course, will refer you to other resources and we participate in intra and interlibrary loan. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with what interlibrary loan is. It's when you go to your local public library and they put in a request. But intralibrary loan is say something is in our Sacramento location and you wanna view it, but Sutra Library is closer to you. And, or you're already going to be at Sutra Library, we can arrange for the Sacramento sections to send that material to Sutra Library and vice versa. If there's something at Sutra Library that you want to see, but you're going to be visiting the California History Room in Sacramento, um, we can arrange to have that sent to, to the California State Library in Sacramento. Again, this is pending the library director's approval, but we can do intro library loan. What we're not able to do is conduct in-depth research, and we aren't able to lend out materials in our special collections. So again, anything located in the vault is our, in our closed stacks, and we also only lend out family histories. You may know them as genealogies. We only lend those out if we have a duplicate, because more often than not, we're the only library in California and one of the few in the country to have a copy of these genealogies. And if it's not eligible for intra or interlibrary loan, we'd be happy to perform a lookup for you and look up your ancestor's name and scan those pages to you. 
Now that we've covered the services, let's talk about some reasons why you should come to the Suture Library. It's a common misconception that everything is online, but in actuality, only a fraction of the records available can be accessed online. And reasons for why they aren't yet digitized could be that the records are too fragile, there are some privacy restrictions, or the records simply don't exist. Or I'd hate to say it, maybe they just haven't been discovered yet. Maybe they are sitting in a box in somebody's attic or basement. I, you know, the archivist in me is like, no, no, don't be in a basement. Um, but yeah, it could be there. Like their records could be that exist that we don't even know exist. Um, so just important to keep in mind that not everything is online. And for what is online, you can still use our collection uh, to, to navigate and better understand online collections. For example, I had a researcher looking at the abstract of probate records that she found in a volume of Rhode Island Genealogical Register, and I found the corresponding collection on Ancestry, only it wasn't fully indexed. So when we used the fields to search the database, nothing came up. Uh, instead, we then used the information from the book to navigate the online collection, which took a lot longer, you know, than just typing in a name. <laughs> um, but we did that and then found the digital image of the probate record, all using the information from a book in our collection. We also offer a wide geographic coverage. And while we do have some materials on California, we mostly focus on the other states. And if you're doing California genealogical research, then I recommend going to the California History Room, um, our sister branch in Sacramento. They are the place to go to for California research. And again, I will be there uh, learning more about this collection very soon. Uh, so if you do visit there, then you'll see me there. Um, and as for Sutra Library, we are particularly strong in uh, Eastern states due to the generosity of local chapters like the DAR. We even have resources for international regions like Canada, Europe, Mexico, and the West Indies, the bulk of which being for the first two, though we do have quite the Mexicana collection. We also offer educational opportunities. We try to do at least four to six genealogy talks a year, and our events have gone virtual, so you don't have to be you know, in San Francisco or in the Bay Area to visit. You can now log into Zoom and view our events from home. And you can also watch recordings on the California State Library YouTube channel under a playlist called Events at Sutro Library. I will have a slide later on talking more about how to access that playlist. But most of our events have been recorded. And our next event is coming up at the end of this month. And again, I'll have details on how to RSVP for that if you want to see it live. Um, but so far, our first two events, uh, they've been recorded and are on the YouTube channel. Other educational opportunities come in the form of exhibits. We have online exhibits, and we just um, a few months ago restarted our on-site exhibits, which highlight rare and antiquarian materials in our collection. So materials from the original Adolf Sutro collection. And right now, the current exhibit is the history of gardens. So if you're ever able to visit in person, you will see exhibit cases lining uh, one side of the reading room with um, these just gorgeous treasures on display for you. And there's a way to get notified about upcoming events and exhibits. It's through our monthly e-newsletter. And I will also mention how to sign up for that later on. Another reason is we're impartial. We're a state agency, we have no agenda, um, and we're here to help you. And who's we? The staff, that's why you should come. We all have a background in rare books and archives, and we're all willing to help you in any way that we can. So even though I'm the genealogy librarian, my colleagues are more than able to help you as well. To further illustrate why you should come visit, I wanted to offer a use case of our library. Prior to the pandemic, we had a few dedicated researchers that visited our library weekly, sometimes even daily. And I decided to ask one of them why she comes to Sutro and not a family history center or some other genealogy library. And she told me that we have everything in one place. There are resources that you can't find anywhere else. And you can easily hop from one state to the next. I wanted to try this out for myself and I, so that I could show you an example of how you could use our collection. And one project that I get to work on is using genealogical research to augment our picture catalog. 
for records of women. And more often than not, these women are cataloged with their husband's name. And like in this example, you can see on your screen, it says Mrs. Dave Williams. So it's my task to you know, find out more about this woman and specifically what was her first and maiden name. Once I do preliminary research through databases like Ancestry uh, or Family Search, I can then go to our catalog and our, our reading room to learn more about this family. Without leaving our reading room, I can visit a number of resources from the family history of the Williams family and land records in Oregon to vital records in Kentucky and periodicals and the Boston transcript genealogy column, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, there are even more resources not included on this slide, like Missouri marriage records or city directories for any of the cities that I, I found her in. And I can also use our public computers to access our subscription databases, such as, again, Ancestry or other databases that we have access to, like Newspaper Archive. Um, and if you wanted to access this collection remotely, say you wanted me to look up David Williams in the Williams family history, that you found it in our catalog or you found it through another resource, I would be able to look this name up for you and scan those pages to you. And as for this specific example, for those interested in hearing what I found, I her name was Rachel Loretta Kelsey and she was born in Kentucky. At some point she moved to Missouri and married David Williams. And in 1843, they joined their families who had traveled previously with John Bidwell to Oregon. John Bidwell continued to California, um, but her family, their family continued to Oregon. And David and Loretta settled in Washington County, Oregon. And sometime after 1860, uh, but before 1870, they moved to California. So my next stop would be our sister branch in Sacramento, the California History Room, where I can learn even more about Loretta. I've already covered a lot of the resources that you can find in our collection, um, but here's a longer list. And uh, I do wanna clarify that when we say church records or, or land records that we, we don't actually like mean the original records, we mean um, like they're available in the form of a record index or abstract. And uh, this is like the majority of our collection. We've got various record indexes and abstracts. There may be a sampling of original records in our archival materials. Um, but it's not like we have a bulk collection of, you know, uh, cemetery records uh, for San Francisco uh, between these years before 1906 fire, like that we don't have those kinds of collections, but we do have resources that have been, the original records that have been indexed and abstracted that you might not find in other libraries. Um, I do want to say that like you never know what you're going to find when you're wondering our stacks. Um, I mean, the same can be true for probably any library, but especially ours. An example I have is that a, a volunteer chanced upon a set of San Francisco phone books from over 100 years ago, and they had been repurposed into um, scrapbooks. Uh, there, there's like various newspaper clippings that have been pasted on these phone books. And I, you know, as a genealogist, like it might be frustrating because you can no longer use it for the purpose it was intended. It was a phone book. But then the archivist in me is... It finds it fascinating because now this phone book has taken on a new life and reflects what the creator thought was important enough to keep. And I do want to further highlight some of these resources for you in uh, the next handful of slides. One of the uses of a genealogy collection is to survey what other research on families and communities have been done so that you can verify, re-examine, maybe even correct another researcher's conclusions. And we have thousands of family histories as well as local histories, which can provide vital information as well as contextual information. And located near our microphone cabinets is a surname and locality catalog. These are ca uh, card catalogs that index the surnames and locations that are mentioned in each title in our reading room. And it's arranged alphabetically. And you, you can think of it as an index of all indexes. While it only indexes what we had up to the 1990s, um, it's still an invaluable source and it's a great place for researchers to start. It is available on microfiche uh, through interlibrary loan. Lastly, our again, I mentioned this earlier, our family histories are special to us and considered a special collection in their own right. 
more often than not, we, we are the only library in California to have a copy. And because of this, it's only eligible for interlibrary loan if we have a duplicate. Again, if you need to look up, uh, we're more than happy to provide that service for you and then scan those pages to you. I wanted to show one of my favorite family histories, which is not what you would see traditionally in a published genealogy. This is a photo book that follows the history of the family wedding veil. And in it, there are photos of the brides wearing the veil, as well as a clipping about their marriage, about the wedding ceremony. And this just serves as an example that you don't have to go the traditional route when creating a published genealogy. You can do a photo book like this one, maybe even center it around an artifact or a piece of clothing. For me, if I went this route, I would do it around a, a locket that has been passed down from firstborn daughter to firstborn daughter um, since my uh, great-great-grandmother immigrated to America. Um, I do also want to show you an example of a local history and some information that you might find from it. As I mentioned earlier, local histories have all sorts of information. Uh, this is one from Wellsburg, Pennsylvania, and it's sandwiched between paragraphs about the cheese factories and the cemetery location is one about the town believing the world is going to end. Um, and, and it says that like, uh, I'll read the blurb for you in case it's hard to read on your screen. But in 1854, prophets prophesied that the world was coming to an end on a certain day. Several nights before, men, women, and children met in the hall of Harley, Harley Sherman's store and held meetings of song service and sermons, preparing for the coming of the end of the world. When the time came, all the people dressed in white and went to the cemetery and held a meeting there. All were ready to enter the other and better world. On that day, an eclipse of the sun was visible here. So it just, it turns out it was just a solar eclipse. And it's super interesting. You can, you can use this information. Like if your family was from Wellsburg, Pennsylvania, you can then embellish your family history or your genealogy that you want to publish and then donate a copy to the Sutra Library. Um, but you can embellish your family history or at least provide context, like contextualize. Like if you had family in 1854, like this is what, what, what must have it been like to believe this. Um, so I wanted to share this with all of you, the kinds of treasures that are hidden in local histories. We also have thousands of telephone and city directories. For our telephone directories, these exist on microfiche and they are only accessible on site. So you won't be able to access our holdings through the catalog. We're currently working on a database to make these holdings more accessible to you. And the range for these years is more recent, from the 1970s to the 2000s. As for our city directories, we have these on microfilm and microfiche, as well as scattered throughout the stacks. So we have some physical copies, but, but not as many as we used to. Um, and we have as early as 1665 to as late as 1986. And while you can find some of these directories online, you know, Ancestry has a pretty big collection online, you won't find smaller or unincorporated cities. And I also want to say that Ancestry, I've noticed, has only a portion of the directories digitized, while we have the complete version on microfilm. And they also don't have a lot of, they might not have the year you're looking for. So for me, they didn't have 1930 Philadelphia City Directory. And I could have wrongly assumed that because it wasn't available through Ancestry that maybe it's not available at all. And I'm glad I didn't because I found it in our collection. We had a copy on microfilm. So definitely important to keep in mind that just because you don't see it online doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So ask your librarian <laughs> and, and they'll help you out and find a copy. All right, I mentioned the Boston Evening Transcript genealogy column earlier. These genealogy columns were published at least twice a week from the late 1890s to 1941, and it's where researchers queried, answered, theorized. I'd say it's similar to a discussion board online or a Facebook group, and it's a valuable resource for New England genealogy and families from the 16 to 1800s. It does cover families west of the Appalachians, though, um, such as Kentucky and Missouri. And the reason why I'm highlighting it is because quite a few researchers have requested scans of the originals for their Lineage Society membership applications. And our library, other libraries I know charge for this and we do not charge for this service. And we don't charge for any of our services. Now I wanna zoom in on a few selections from our reading room. 
These next resources are sort of our, our crown jewels and may or may not help further your research, but they're worth mentioning because they are our most requested titles from our genealogy collection. First up is King's Daughters and Founding Mothers, which is a biographical dictionary of the nearly 800 women and girls sent from France to populate the colony of New France in Canada between 1663 and 1673, and it's two volumes. After defining who can be considered, and forgive my French, a field or roy, this work presents comprehensive biographies of all the King's Daughters, including information never before available in English, and it also includes photographs and reproductions of artwork relating to the daughters, and it even has biographies of the 36 women falsely identified as daughters. What's super interesting is that the King's daughters were given a choice on whom to marry, and you see in the biographies quite a few contracts were, were annulled, and then new matches were made. Many of the women would not have had this type of agency or freedom had they stayed in France. So if you have French Canadian roots, there's a strong chance you may be related to a king's daughter. Called the father of Southwest Louisiana genealogy, Reverend Donald Haybear compiled the definitive source for family members who have roots in Louisiana. <clears throat> father Haybear's opus contains information that's been meticulously extracted from Southwest Louisiana church and courthouse records, which span two centuries from 1750s to the 1950s, and it covers 13 parishes. It occupies three shelves in our reading room, and it's arranged chronologically and contains abstracts that include information on births, marriages, baptisms, and deaths. And you can also find parish histories, cattle brands, maps, tombstone inscriptions, court transcripts, and photocopies of original documents throughout this set. And through the help of the California State Library Foundation, we completed our set, and we're now the only library west of Salt Lake City to have all 52 volumes. And all the volumes are extraordinary resources that contain utterly unique information. However, I do want to highlight one volume, which is volume 33. Volume 33 also contains an index of the sections found within like the first 33 volumes, so volumes one through 33. But it also contains abstractions of what's known as the records of Blacks 1765 to 1886. However, if you are doing African-American genealogical research, it would be wise to look through each volume as there are names mixed throughout. The last reading room highlight is Izmir list of 7,300 names of Jewish brides and grooms compiled by Dove Cohen. And it's one of Sutra Library's most popular genealogy titles, if not the most popular. Apart from the Sutra Library, this 27-page index is only available at one other library in California, the Los Angeles Family History Library, and it's only available at a few other libraries nationwide. It was This index was created from marriage records, um, marriage contracts that uh, from the Jewish community of Izmir in Turkey, and it lists the names of brides and grooms who married between the years of 1883 to 1901 and 1918 to 1933. And the original records include information on the fathers of the bride and groom, the date of marriage, the name of the synagogue, and the amount of the dowry. The author states that the original information was written in a script known to be linked to Sephardic Jews and these are Jews who originate from the Iberian Peninsula. And one reason that this index might be in such high demand right now is that in 2015, both Spain and Portugal began granting citizenship to those who could prove that they descended from Jews expelled from Spain and Portugal at the end of the 15th century. So even if you have Ashkenazi ancestry, and that's if you have Jewish ancestors who originate from Central or Eastern Europe, there's a strong chance that you may have an ancestor who was expelled in 1492. And these last three highlights, the Izmir list, the Southwest Louisiana records, and the King's Daughters, I wrote a blog post about each of them, and I'll tell you in a moment how to access our blog, but if you're interested in learning more, I definitely encourage you to check that out. I wanted to end our reading room section uh, with a list of some of the other resources that aren't widely available but may help with your genealogical research or help provide context for your family history. Uh, we have this first one, we have this wonderful um, biographical narrative about the author and her great grandmother, or her grandmother, excuse me, and this quilt that was made out of used clothing and how she learned about her family history through these um, articles of clothing. 
And um, we have a couple other books um, that are, are, are quite fascinating. Many of the family histories are donated to us throughout the year, and uh, we are also able to expand our collection through the California State Library Foundation to um, especially uh, include, like, get re more books on uh, underrepresented groups. And uh, you can take a screenshot if you want to check these out later. So I'll pause for a moment so you can do that because this is not on your handout, but you can always go back to the recording to check it out. I will say um, we have had for two of these titles, we've had a book talk, a virtual book talk. So you can watch a book talk on I've Been Here All the While, Black Freedom on Native Land. Oh, actually, that talk wasn't recorded, but we do have the book in our collection. Um, but the one virtual talk that we have had is The Mystery Aussie John C. C. Chen by Pamela Lee Wong. And that was a talk from last year. So that was an amazing talk. I definitely encourage you all to check that out if you can. Um, but so some of these books that we get end up turning into um, talks for our programming. All right, an interesting fact about our library is that while we are a genealogy library, we exist to care and make accessible the antiquarian collection of Adolf Sutro. And some of the materials that Sutro collected can be used for genealogical research, um, like these, the image on the left with the, the photograph, and there's a diary that's in this book form, and um, or it's hidden in like a case that's shaped like a book, and some letters. The upper right image is a pedigree chart in a lawyer's case files, and some of the materials um, we have collected since uh, Adolf Sutro passed have been from, have been archival papers, including from genealogists. And that last image is an example of that, a, a collection that was donated to us from a, a genealogist. And yeah, it, it includes hair. <laughs> that is a braid of hair that you see on your screen. Uh, again, if the materials in our collection say they're located in the vault, that's not the same as the open stacks as in our reading room. You'll need to request these materials in advance and schedule an appointment through the appointment system. And you'll have a link on your handout on how to do that. Um, and you need to give us at least 72 hours advance so that we have time to page those materials as they are harder to find than regular books. Now, I wanna show you some of these unique resources. I, I think I highlight three of them for you. First up, we have a local favorite from our vault. And I mentioned our city and telephone directories earlier. And here's a truly unusual one from barely three and a half weeks after the 1906 earthquake and fire. It's 48 pages and could be the earliest post-earthquake telephone directory. Uh, here we show where the Sutro family is listed. And this directory is remarkable on many levels, not the least of which is Pacific States Telephone and Telegraph Company's ability to rebuild much of its infrastructure and restore service in a remarkably short period of time. Next, we have this huge photo album of David B. Gamble's travels in Europe with his brother, Edwin Gamble, and included is a souvenir passenger list. And that is shown in the lower left image on to the left of the, sh uh, the photo of the ship. And the passenger list lists the, the names of the passengers and their cities of residence. For the Gambles, they were from Cincinnati, Ohio. And if the name Gamble sounds familiar to you and makes you think of Procter and Gamble, you would not be mistaken. Edwin and David were the sons of the co-founder, James Gamble, who immigrated to America from Ireland in 1819. Interesting story. We had no idea this belonged to that Gamble family until I did a little genealogy research, and believe it or not, the information in that passenger list was enough to get me started. The last highlight that I wanted to show you is our pocket-sized Emancipation Proclamation. It was given to newly freed slaves as proof of their freedom and was read aloud by Union soldiers in Confederate territory so that the official words of the president could be heard firsthand. The proclamation paved the way for the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery in the United States on December 6, 1865. And given the fragility of this item, viewing it does require an appointment and has use restrictions. Um, but you're welcome to see it in person. You can see how tiny it is. It's not even like four inches uh, long. Look at that. It's so tiny. Anyway, uh, these are some of the treasures that you can find in our closed stacks. All right, for the next part of this presentation, I'd like to go over how you can access some of the California State Library resources remotely, and we'll cover the catalog 
the Genealogy Hub, outside access points like the Online Archives of California, and ways to interact with the Sutro Library online and how to learn more about our collection. There are a few ways to get to the catalog. To name two of them, you can either type in this URL, catalog.library.ca.gov, or you can go through the California State Library homepage um, and go to their popular links by scrolling down. If you wanna do an advanced search, you can just click that option to the right of that red circle that you see on your screen. And it'll be similar to other databases and catalogs. There, you'll have more fields and filters for your search. Um, but for this example, I'm focusing on basic search. And here's a screenshot of the drop-down menu. And you want to specify that you're searching the library catalog or it'll bring up results from databases that we have subscriptions to. And unless you're a state worker or you're on site, those results might be confusing. You may also wanna check out the picture catalog uh, if you're interested in seeing wonderful images relating to California history. I recommend searching by subject or location uh, and record type. If you search by your ancestors' names, it, you, don't, you might not get any results. Uh, so it's better to broaden your search terms. And in this example, I'm looking for Philadelphia city directories. So I type in Philadelphia directory, but I don't put the Y, I put an asterisk. And what that will do is search variants of the word. So directory, directories, it's also gonna bring up results with the word director, but what can you do? Um, it's, you do wanna disregard this yellow bar. So just hit dismiss. Uh, it, it makes you think that we're hiding results from you unless you sign in, and that is not the case. So just go ahead and dismiss that. And there are multiple ways to filter your search on the left-hand side, but if you specifically want to see what the Sutro Library has, if any of the results are in the Sutro Library, then click Library, and Sutro Library will pop up if those results are also in the holdings for Sutro. So from this example, we see that 63, the number in parentheses next to Sutro, of the 119 results are at the Sutro Library. If you wanted to modify your search, uh, maybe I wanted to say Philadelphia City directory, um, then I would have to then go back and hit the filter again because it won't save my filter. So just important to keep that in mind. Our online genealogy webpage um, has these tiles that provide more information for you and it's a great review of what's covered in this presentation especially physical collections, which is the second, uh, it's the second tile in the second row. Uh, so that's a great review for you. If you want, if you don't want to watch the recording, uh, you could just check out our webpage for yourself and go to physical collections and also see this, the main genealogy homepage. I do want to highlight the online resources tab and specifically the genealogy hub. And that was created by someone, some of you may know, who used to work for the California State Library, Karina Robinson, who's a, an amazing person and a wonderful uh, professional genealogist now. And uh, so if you ever see that she's speaking, doing a talk, I highly recommend attending her talks. Um, so she helped to create this hub while she was working at the California State Library. And it's a page that provides an overview of the different sections and the genealogical resources that we have. And I specifically wanna highlight the toolkit, which is the first link under the, the welcome message. And this toolkit provides tips and strategies to help with your search. There's a way to fill out a pedigree chart and download it to your computer. We won't save that information. So you definitely wanna make sure you download it. You can also just download a blank copy. And I wanna highlight the helpful links. And there are hundreds of helpful outside links um, located in that upper right. You see it circled in red right now. And these are organized by region and culture or subject and type. It's like a mini version of Cindy's list. And it has categories that you might not think to use for your research, like amateur and professional sports or international agency collections. So the genealogy collection is a invaluable resource and I encourage you all to explore it when you have the chance. I mentioned the Online Archive of California earlier, and this is a catalog of archival finding aids, aka inventories, across California. So it's not to say that the collections are California specific, that, that they're all California specific. It, you can find collections for uh, materials and families from all over the world. It just means they're physically located in California. You can search by keyword, location, collection, institution, and I do recommend searching an ancestor's name or somebody in their fan club. And for those who don't know, fan club, it stands for Friends, Family, 
associates and neighbors. And you can see what pops up. Uh, and there might be something in somebody's archives that is related to your ancestor, you didn't know it. Um, to see what Sutra Library has, go to the middle section and scroll down to California State Library, and then Sutra Library is listed under that. And after you click on it, you'll be taken to an alphabetical listing of our finding aids. And even if you don't see what you're looking for, um, you can contact us because maybe we have something in our uncatalogued section, or we might know of a resource that would help you. This is an example of what the finding aid looks at, what it looks like through the OAC when you click on it. And so this is our Munsell White family papers. And you can, uh, you know, there's multiple ways to look at this actual finding aid. You can download the PDF. You could search using the search box. You could also click under detailed list of collect contents. You can uh, click that and actually see the detailed list through the site. So there are multiple ways to interact with this finding aid. And in this collection, there are many items that can be used for genealogical research, including a land deed. And in this deed, we learn that in 1874, J.G. Anderson purchased a burial plot at lot 19, block three in the Bryan City Cemetery located in Brazos County, Texas. And I used find a grave to see if there was any record of who might be buried in this plot by searching for that specific cemetery. <clears throat> and then by surname, Anderson. I know I'm, I'm assuming that whoever's buried in this plot also shared the same surname, um, but that's what I decided to use as my term. So I used, I looked for that specific cemetery in find a grave, then search Ans Anderson. And then I narrowed it down by who may have lived or died around this purchase. So I might've done like a 20 year range. And it brought me a Sally P. Anderson. She was buried in the same cemetery, in the same plot. And according to her gravestone, she was the wife of J.G. Anderson. And all this is to say that archival collections have materials that you can use for your research. I mentioned our blog earlier, and it's a great place to learn about our special collections, about our genealogy collection. You can either like scroll through the different articles or type in a keyword search. Uh, you can search my name, Devorah, or my last name, and it will pull up all the posts that I've written, um, which are mostly genealogically focused. And we also have a way to search by tags. So you'll just scroll to the bottom of the blog and see all the different tags or categories that have been assigned to these blog posts. Uh, for example, genealogy will be a tag, and you can click on that and see all the genealogy posts. In this screenshot is a post that I wrote about critical family history, which provides an overview of our 2021 programming, which had a theme of critical family history and tips and strategies for how a researcher can look at their family history through a more multidimensional and critical lens. And most of the posts, again, they, that I've written are genealogically focused. And I mentioned earlier that I wrote a post about the Izmir list, the Southwest Louisiana records, and the, um, the daughters. So if you wanted to learn more about that, you would do so through our blog. And there are also posts on our special collections that have been written also by our guests or any of our volunteers. So just go to the sutralibrary.wordpress.com and, and check it out. That um, has a treasure trove there. Sutra Library is not just a, a physical hub for the genealogy community, but we are also a virtual hub and we're working on being even more so these days. Uh, we've been the host of the Bay Area Genealogy Calendar for almost five years, and it's a place where the community can go to see local and family history events in their area. You can find it on our homepage uh, in that big orange box, and we have a featured event every month. And the calendar itself, you can click on each event and get a more detailed description. And it'll also tell you if it's virtual, if it's in person. So even if you aren't in the Bay Area, there might be virtual talks that you are able to attend. Um, and if you don't like the calendar view, you can view it in list form by clicking the agenda tab. So I hope this is useful for you all and you find a talk that um, you're interested in attending. I mentioned earlier the bulk of the Sutra Library's telephone directories exist on microfiche and cover more recent years from the 1970s to 2000s. And the holdings, again, they were previously only accessible on site and not through our catalog. So we created a database so that researchers can access the holdings remotely. 
And you can find it via this link or through our genealogy page in the online resources tile, which you see in the screenshot. Oh, one moment, sorry, it's not advancing. There we go. All right, and this is what that database looks like. It includes information on the title of the directory, often the city or the county that is represented here, um, the year of publication, <clears throat> the type, like yellow or white pages, and some entries include a notes field detailing the communities that are included in that directory. And you can click on the green plus sign to expand that field uh, if there is a notes field. We're currently uploading the entries for every 10 states that we complete, so you may not yet return results for your area of interest. We have finished the first 10, the first batch of 10s, and we're going alphabetically. So I think we're up to Georgia um, for what's been published online. And there are multiple ways to search. Uh, as you can see on your, this slide, you can do it by keyword, you can do it by filter, you can do it by filters first, then keyword. Unfortunately, you can't do a keyword search and then filter it. So those are the three ways that you can search the phone fish database. And, and again, I hope that this resource is also useful for you all. I also mentioned earlier um, programming. And so we moved online in the summer of 2020. And since then, most of our events have been recorded and are freely available on the California State Library YouTube channel under a playlist called Events at Sutro Library. You can also access it through our genealogy homepage and by selecting the library events. And examples of recordings you'll find include from 2020, This Land is Their Land, a book talk with Dr. Silverman, which coincided with the 400th anniversary of the Mayflower voyage and shed some light on the myths of Plymouth Colony and Thanksgiving. And from 2021, a specific event, a note is Harris v. Sutro, an early civil rights battle at Sutro Baths, where um, Elaine Ellenson presented on the little known but historically significant case of Harris v. Sutro, where John Harris challenged segregation in San Francisco. Both of these talks and more are available to watch anytime. If you have any questions, there are multiple ways to contact us. You can email us, you can call us. Um, we, you know, are, we're open Tuesdays through Thursdays, but um, even though we have those limited hours, we do check the reference desk, desk phone as well as our personal work phones frequently and the email we check daily. <clears throat> Ask a Librarian is another way, and it's accessible through the navigation bar of our website. So no matter where you are in the California State Library website, you have that Ask a Librarian feature. You'll click on it and just fill in, at least fill in the fields that have a check mark next to them. And then your question will be directed to a librarian who will respond within two business days to your inquiry. We often get requests that are paragraphs long um, with information that's unnecessary for the question at hand. So I wanted to provide tips for <laughs> not just the California State Library, but any library or organization that you contact for assistance. You wanna keep it short and you don't wanna forget key pieces of information about your ancestor or what, whatever you're looking for. The name of the person, where an event happened, when that event happened, what are you looking for? And an example I have is I'm looking for Ida Gross's marriage license, which may have happened in Philadelphia between the years of 1912 when she arrived and 1916 when her first child was born. Her husband was named Harry Cohen. So just something to keep in mind when you ask for help. Um, this really helps us a lot in uh, narrowing your question and finding what you're looking for. Our newsletter began, you know, two years ago, again, as a way to maintain contact with our patrons whom we call Sutronians. It publishes the first week of every month and this month's already went out. So, um, and we are going on a summer hiatus. So the next newsletter will not publish until September, um, but you will receive a confirmation email if you were to sign up for a newsletter now. And to keep up to date on the events or any happenings at our library, um, sign up for it. And there's the link, or you can go through the State Library homepage, click join our mailing list. Both the link and doing that will take you here. Just type in the information that's required and click Sutra Library Updates. There are also newsletters for the other sections, um, but you definitely wanna make sure that you put a check next to Sutra Library Updates so that you can subscribe. And you can also get to this through our genealogy webpage if you don't wanna write the link down, but the link is on your uh, handout. Uh, we often get, patrons who want to donate their genealogical research to our library. And while we appreciate the offer, 
we are unable to accept due to space constraints. So instead, we will consider donations of family papers, artifacts, and published family histories, family genealogies. We prefer that these be hardbound if possible. Um, we also, like if you're able to donate two copies, then that will mean that one of them can circulate. Otherwise, one copy will just stay in our library. We would be so grateful for even just one copy of your family history. If you're interested in donating in any way, please contact the Sutra Library Director, Maddie Taramina. There's her email address. It's also on your handout and I will have it on at the end, at the end slide. Here's an example of what a genealogist donated to us. And you you saw um, something from her collection earlier on and gifted to us in her will. We were sent about 15 binders worth of genealogical research, uh, original documents, photographs. And I went through these and an undergraduate student helped with the finding aid. We're still working on finishing the finding aid before we publish it to the OAC. But in these binders, she included pages that were much like a scrapbook with photos or other documents, along with typewritten excerpts from Charlotte, um, the, the person who donated it. So these family papers are the Charlotte and Boone Freddy family papers. And you'll find hair, which is what you saw earlier. You'll find a horse's pedigree chart. <clears throat> and also in the collection is a World War I nurse's military passport. And you see that on your screen. I use this in a class um, that I teach to undergraduate students every semester about conducting genealogical research. So the collection isn't just sitting in boxes, it's being used with love and care, um, but it's being used and being seen. And I'm in awe of this collection and its creator as well as honored that she entrusted our library with it. And you guessed it, there is a blog post that is about this collection that I wrote. So it's called Marvelous Mrs. Ferretti if you wanna check that out and learn more about this collection. Our next event is on June 22nd at 4 p.m. Uh, Pacific time, and it's Charity and Sylvia, a same-sex marriage in early America, and it's with Dr. Rachel Hope Cleves, who will share the story of Charity Bryant and Sylvia Drake, two ordinary women who lived in an extraordinary same-sex marriage in rural Vermont, and they you can RSVP for that at june 2022 sutro.eventbrite.com and I, i'll enter that link into the chat momentarily to make it easy for you to rsvp but it's online and it should be from about an hour and a half and i hope to see you all there um and virtually of course and we've come to the end of my presentation if you have twitter instagram and facebook and or facebook you don't have to have all three please follow us at sutro library You'll find my contact info as well as the library director's contact info on this slide. You can reach out, reach out to us if you have any questions or if you want to tell us how much you enjoyed this presentation. And you'll also want to jot down the general email, um, suture at library.ca.gov, which will be especially helpful if you contact us after the end of June. So come July 1st, uh, when I've already transferred to the California history section. Anyway, I hope you found this presentation useful and that we will all see you virtually or physically in the Sutra Library very soon. Thank you, and I'm now ready for questions. Awesome, thank you. If you want, you can go ahead and turn on your camera, say hi to the lovely folks at home. Oh, okay. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I know they enjoy putting a face with the voice so yeah um thank you so much that was fantastic and um I know I got some great information from that so thank you um but there's questions mm -hmm. let's get to them I'm gonna go ahead and just read some of these to you and we'll see um where we end up I don't want to keep people too terribly late so um Somebody asked very early if there's specific portions of the country that you have information. Um, from what I've heard, you have a lot of information and it's all over. Yes, it's, so I, it is from all over. And as I said, we're mostly, like we definitely have a robust collection in the Eastern states um, because of, you know, local chapters like the DAR who have helped to maintain our collection. Um, so I would say that, yeah, it's like a lot of that is in that part of the country. Um, but we do have materials for all over the country. And again, some outside of it. 
uh, especially this Mexicana collection, which a lot of they're in Spanish. So if you can, uh, if you're able to read Spanish, um, there there could very well be a lot of genealogical information in them. Awesome. Um, someone's wondering if you offer remote access to old San Francisco newspapers, such as being able to use ProQuest or similar archives to look up old obituaries and news stories. I know that we have databases too. We have like newspapers.com and newspaper archive. Um, so a subscription to those databases. Um, the California history section has the newspaper collection. So it's definitely something you would wanna contact them about. I believe that they, whenever somebody is looking for an obituary, that the California history section sends those microfilm for whatever years you need um, to your local library. And you can then find the obituary that way. <clears throat> There's also this free, oh my gosh, I want to blank on the name, but there is a free um, newspaper database called, it's like the California Digital Newspaper Collection. And so you can try searching that way. I do think there might be some San Francisco newspapers online through that. But as for Sutra Library having it, I we might have a few runs of San Francisco newspapers. I'm The name is escaping me, but California history section is where you'd want to go. Um, yeah. Perfect. Okay, so the California digital newspaper collection, I just put the link in the chat. Thank you. Not a problem. That's what, that's what librarians are for. Um, okay, so let's see here. Um, if documents are ordered, how long does it take to receive it? What is the cost? It doesn't cost anything. And so, yeah, if you are looking, if you want to look up and you want scans, we don't send hard copies. Um, we'll send you like a digital file that given that I'm leaving and, and I don't know how much time it'll be until my successor is brought on board, um, the staff who's here will work their hardest to get those requests in. So I can't say how much time it'll take. Um, maybe you know, at most, maybe it might take a week, depending on what kind of request it is. If it's just like a quick lookup in a book, that might take a, a day or two. Um, but and yeah, that would that would be the time frame I'd give it. But just I, I, obviously, you know, exercise a little bit more patience than normal, given the transition that the Sutra Library is going to be going through in the next couple of months. But we'll get it done. Perfect. Um, so there's a couple people in who have asked this, which I think is kind of impressive. Um, can a retired state employee get a library card? Oh, that's a great question. I think the answer is yes. Um, I've uh, so they're on the homepage. I believe there's in like the blue bar. It says get a library card. Um, there's a way to like, you go through this process. Like it says, are you a state worker? I think there might be a section that says, are you a, Oh, sorry. Um, we have these, uh, let me mute myself while this message is going on. Sorry. No worries. We very frequently have messages that we have to mute ourselves for. So uh, I think our attendees are used to that. Um, it happens. <laughs> Yeah, it's gonna, so we're in a university building and we're on summer's schedule. And um, so the library closes at five, the building closes at five. And so then at 4.30, 4.45 and five o'clock, these messages are gonna be going. Okay, so the question, retired state workers, um, definitely ask about that because I don't know for sure, but I wanna say yes. Um, so I can find the link for that too, uh, if you, uh, if you'd like, but we can go on to the next question while I, while I look for that. Okay. So um, somebody was asking when you were talking about the West Indies, they wanted to know if that included Haiti. That's a great question. Um, I'd have to double check on that. Like I could look in our catalog or you can also look in our catalog, but I, I think so. Um, I'm not sure how many materials that we would have on Haiti. Um, yeah, that's a great question. I see, it's like our collection is so huge that I can't like know. Like sometimes I get like these uh, specific questions that like I, I, I don't know uh, sometimes, but I, I'm definitely willing to spend some time to find the answer for you. Uh, so you can email me uh, and I could 
to, I could help you discover what we have in our collection on Haiti. Awesome. So I'm on the page where it has the library card application and it says it has current, it looks like. I don't see retired yeah. for any of these options. So um, that's kind of interesting. Yeah, I don't know why I thought it was yes. I'm sorry about that. But I I would like to double check that because I thought I thought the answer was yes. Um, so I'm actually going to double check that too. You can also email me uh, and uh, get an answer from me to follow up with me on if I found out more information. But I'm sorry about that. Um, if it's no is the answer. That's unfortunate if it is. Who knows? That's just what the one website that I found yeah. very quickly in the two seconds I took to search. So I don't see it either as an option when I was looking for getting a, getting a state library card. Um, <gasps> Fair enough. Okay. Um, let's see here. There are so many great questions. Um, all right. So somebody's wanting to know if you can uh, take photos with a cell phone. Oh, of like books and stuff. Yeah, we ask no flash, um, but yeah, you can use your use your phone to take photos. Awesome, and um, we're running low on time, so just in the um, just to keep things short and sweet, and to respect everyone's time, um, we're just going to do one last question. If you didn't get your question answered. Um, on the screen, you can see our wonderful speaker's contact information. Um, you can contact us at genealogy at acpl.info. Please feel free to reach out with those questions. We want to make sure that you get the answers that you're looking for. But let's go ahead and go to this last question and then we'll wrap up. Um, so someone is trying to find the best place for minor information. Um, somebody has family that arrived in Hangtown, Placerville in 1852. Um, they mined around the area for a while. One of them landed in Sacramento as a blacksmith in the later 1800s. Should they check out the California History Room in Sacramento? How would, it, how would they search for that? I would recommend going to the online archive of California um and searching that way i mean i know i did say that they have some collections that aren't from california but they do have a lot of questions from california so you could use your key terms to search the oac and yeah the california history room um they they very well might have materials on that for sure awesome i'm gonna put that in there okay perfect well Sorry guys that we didn't get to everybody's questions. There's some amazing questions in here. So please, please, please reach out. Um, but thank you so much for an amazing presentation. That was wonderful to learn more about the Sutra Library. Um, I had the opportunity to learn a little bit before and this just kind of expanded my knowledge. So thank you from me and thank you from all of our attendees. Um, it was a pleasure. It was, it was, it was my pleasure too. Thank you for inviting me. I, I like I mentioned when, before we let people in, it's truly an honor to speak for your library. Um, and I hope you all found this useful. So thank you. Thank you. I hope everybody has a wonderful evening. See you next yeah. time. Bye. Bye.